Yes, there is a crisis in the United States, the largest drug problem in history, with over 250,000 deaths attributed to opioids. Dr. Andrew Saxon and Dr. Richard Reese are taking on that crisis one person at a time. There are actually three uh, different types of opioids. There are the opioids that occur naturally in the opium poppy, which humans have known about for thousands of years and used for their medicinal purposes for thousands of years. And there are about 20 different uh, molecular compounds in there, but the main ones that uh, have an effect on, on humans are codeine and morphine, that they occur naturally in nature. Then there are a whole host of similar chemicals that humans have produced in the laboratory, either by slightly modifying the, the compounds codeine and morphine that occur in the opium poppy or by just synthesizing something brand new in the lab. Then finally, there are opioids that animals produce in their systems, including humans, the endogenous opioids. And the similarity between all of these three different opioids is that they all attach to opioid receptors, which are um, in the human brain and control a lot of important functions in our brain and our body. So that being said, why is it a problem? It's natural. It is natural. And <clears throat> just like with uh, all uh, psychoactive medicines and psychoactive drugs, uh, we have natural channels in our brain that can be hijacked by uh, external chemicals. And uh, it's a problem because most of those drugs that cause uh, dependence uh, cause tolerance and dependence uh, over time. Opioids are especially uh, powerful and cause that kind of thing and what happens when you use opioids over time is you get tolerant and dependent to dose one and then you end up on dose two, get tolerant and dependent on dose two and then move to dose three, etc. So you end up uh, on a high dose of opioids, which then start controlling your life. Well, they do many things in the brain and the body. Uh, reducing a, a pain awareness is one of those important things. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You said reducing pain awareness. That means that the pain is still there. The painkillers that I may take are not killing my pain. They're just fixing my brain to not recognize it? Not, not to be as aware of it and not to be uh, so emotionally engaged with the physical sensations of pain. Mm. Uh, and, but uh, another important thing that, that opioids do, which all substances that humans uh, can become de dependent on do, is that they um, indirectly stimulate the brain reward system, so they make people feel good and give people euphoria. And that initially is why people want to go back and take them over and over in many cases. And then in some cases there are the situations where someone develops pain, gets exposed to opioids, and it does reduce the pain awareness and the, uh, the pain suffering, and then they want to continue to use them. And then they get into the cycle that Dr. Reese just mentioned where they need more and more and more to get the effect that they were looking for, and then you have someone who's got opioid use disorder. Opioids are a class of drugs derived from opium. The use was strictly controlled for decades in the United States, but things changed. For many, many years through the last century, the amount of uh, uh, opioids used uh, in an, ad shall we say, an addictive fashion was relatively stable. Uh, studies done in the 80s and 90s showed, early 90s showed that <clears throat> there were about 350,000 people dependent on opioids in that addictive manner around the United States. Uh, those were mostly in large cities and there was mostly heroin and those were mostly done through injection, through needles. Non-prescribed, uh, you know, heroin bought on the street, illegal, all that kind of thing. Uh, what happened in the 90s is through some faulty research and through a lot of uh, problems with the way doctors and pharmaceutical companies work together, uh, we started prescribing uh, opioids for minor pain and for uh, the kinds of things that, that when I was in training and was Andy was training, they said don't use opiates for that. Only use opiates for acute crash kind of pains or acute injuries kind of pains or terminal life 
kinds of pains, but don't use them for headaches or bumped knees or sore arms or all those kinds of things. And what happened is, <clears throat> starting in the 90s, the number of people exposed to strong opiates uh, went up by 10 or 20 or 30 times over the next uh, 10 years. So you had a, a psychoactive substance, opioids, we all have natural opiate receptors in our bodies. Most people in the past, before the 90s, didn't ever get exposed to heavy doses of opiates. And then through the medical profession, pharmaceutical industry, we now had a whole batch of people exposed to high dose opiates. That's kind of like dragging a sieve through society. Certain people become tolerant and dependent to that feeling and to those receptors in ways that others don't, and those are the people who ended up with opiate use disorders. According to the New England Journal of Medicine, in the 1980s, less than 1% of patients at Boston University's medical center became addicted to pain medication. But a decade later, doctors were regularly prescribing opioids for pain. Doctors were even taught by Purdue Pharma that OxyContin was time-released and wouldn't cause the euphoria that led to addiction. Was it shoddy work by doctors that resulted in the opioid crisis? Well, I, I wouldn't call it shoddy work. I think that uh, physicians were really told uh, that the compassionate, humane thing to do was to treat pain with opioids and that people would not become dependent or develop a use disorder, and that's what uh, well-intended physicians believed. Uh, yes, there were a few physicians who were running pill mills and they were just trying to make a lot of money writing these prescriptions, but they were few and far between. So uh, it, uh, really, I think the whole medical profession um, was misguided, as, as Dr. Reese uh, mentioned, when uh, this idea became current that anyone with any kind of pain that went on and on should be given an opioid. It takes two to tango, too. You know, it was not just the, the doctors, but the pharmaceutical companies began to market. They could find there's pain, there, there's money in them, they're ills, as <laughs> some, be, some people have said. Um, and so we had this huge amount of prescribing, and, and people who never used to get exposed got exposed. One of the first patients I ever had uh, in a study that Dr. Saxon uh, hosted in this area that uh, when we started using buprenorphine, which is an opiate system stabilizer, and one of the key medicines in treating opiate addiction, one of the first patients I had, believe it or not, this was a 21-year-old kid who was, had been an Eagle Scout and had been like the straightest straight arrow kid that you've ever seen in your life. You probably would have hated him when you were in high school because he was so perfect. He was given oxycodone after a major dental procedure and took and, and they gave him 30 days supply of oxycodone which he all took in like three or four days because he took it and all of a sudden it was like this magic feeling that he had this magic feeling of oh my god I I've never felt all of a sudden I feel like the real me you know and he he ate them all in about three days called the doctor up and said hey, I lost my pills, and you know, this guy had never lied to anybody in his whole life. Got another one, took the whole bottle in about three days, and on the one week after that, he robbed a pharmacy. Then he robbed three more pharmacies, and uh, he came to me through a benevolent, smart judge who said, this is crazy, something's going on here, we need an expert opinion. So. This, that was just a perfect example, and that, that was like a slap in the face for me, just seeing how dramatic uh, that bad prescribing could expose somebody to something they never would have been exposed before, and how when the opiate receptor takes over, it really takes over. People start doing things they would never do in their life. They start lying, although they've never told a lie before. They start stealing, though they've never stolen before. So it, it starts steering the ship. No, you're no longer steering the ship. So the dependency can take place that fast. It can take that fast. In popular culture, a drug addict looks like a drug addict. So the obvious question, what does an opioid addict look like? We prefer uh, not to use the term 
opioid addict because we find that that's stigmatizing and we, what we really have, um, as Dr. Reese just described so eloquently, we have uh, good people who are suffering from a very bad disease. So we prefer to call them people or individuals who have opioid use disorder. And what do they look like? They look like anyone from any uh, strata of society. Um, they look like you and me. There's no way that you're gonna pick them out on the street. They're really members of our family, people we know, people we work with. And, and let me add to that. I think that the, um, the, the, you know, the, the public's view, the stereotype view of people with addiction is uh, end of the road alcoholic people, you know, the classic kind of view of that uh, skid row kind of stuff. And the same thing with opiate addicts. People with opiate use disorders aren't just that. There are still those kinds of folks around, but what's happened since the 90s, there are 350,000 of, quote, those kind of folks back in the early 90s. There's now three and a half million plus, mostly middle class white people who have become exposed, because they're the ones seeing doctors, they're the ones who had this and that and the other pain, they're the ones who learned, and unfortunately this is true of our society right now, pain means opioids. Wow. If I've got pain, I need an opioid. And unfortunately, bad research in the mid-90s through the Purdue Pharma basically created the, the pain vital sign. And the Joint Commission on Hospital and other regulatory agencies said, you have to document people's pain and respond to that in any medical visit. And so the system got bamboozled and they helped to spread the issue. Because if you were a doctor and you were seeing somebody and they said, I think I need opioids, I got really bad back pain. And you said, well, I don't think that's good for you. It's not, it's not healthy. They'd say, yeah, but I'm in pain and you're withholding that medicine from me. And they're gonna go on your Yelp site and rate you as a bad doctor. So there was a whole lot of forces kind of moving with the medical society to create this monster. You mean doctors look at Yelp sites and say, you know, I'm not prescribing enough pain medication, so I need to do that, so I will have a higher Yelp rating? Well, it's a sad statement, except for uh, that's just a dramatic example of it. But when you've got people walking out of your office and you have people reporting you to the medical disciplinary board because you didn't ass assess or treat their pain right mm -hmm. and it says you're supposed to uh, and opiates equaled pain, you know, that, that kind of terrible thing went round and round and helped wow. to create this monster. Well, that's got to be incredibly tough on doctors trying to do the right thing. Do opioids have the same effect on everyone? No, they don't. That's a very important point. So uh, there are people who are more susceptible to liking opioids based uh, very much on genetics. Mm -hmm. And we, we know it's genetics. We have no idea which genes um, in our 23,000 genome set uh, make people more susceptible. Uh, and probably also based somewhat on life experiences, if people have had stressful life experiences, uh, they may be more susceptible. Most people actually don't like opioids. They might take them if they need them in, a, say, in a surgical situation, and they'll say, this makes me feel woozy and dizzy and upsets my stomach, and I want to get off this thing as fast as I can. But then there are the people who are susceptible to them. And it looks like that's about uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the people who get exposed to opioids because they're in pain. Uh, which is a size of, turns out to be a sizable number. This brings us to the questions of pain and pain management. Is tolerance to pain genetic? Is dependence on drugs genetic? Well, what we should be doing is, for people who have chronic pain, uh, as Dr. Reese has mentioned, during the 90s and the early 2000s, the reflex response was to give opioids. And what we now know is opioids are not a good treatment for chronic pain. And there are other treatments that should be used primarily. Mm -hmm. the, the best treatments for chronic pain are actually forms of psychotherapy that help people, just like opioids do, 
to get away from focusing on their pain and start focusing on living their life um, and enjoying life and minimizing the emotional impact of the pain. The problem we have, those types of therapies are not, uh, not readily available uh, to the average primary care provider or even to the average patient. Insurance isn't necessarily gonna pay for that. So we have a healthcare system that's uh, driven to find the cheapest, easiest solution rather than the best solution. Yeah, let me add to that. The, um, I remember I went to a, one of the first meetings of the state opioid task force back in the early 90s. I think Andy was probably there too. And they ask uh, neurosurgeons and uh, all these people who, and back surgeons, you know, what do you need more of? And they, and they all said, what we need more of is CBT, physical therapy, and yoga teachers. That's what they, they, they didn't want more opioid. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, oh. the kind of psychotherapy that Andy was talking about. Because that's what helps most chronic pain conditions over time. That changes function and improves. And in Washington State, we're, we're very lucky. Gary Franklin, who's head of the state labor and industries, did studies some years ago showing that people who had back pain injuries, the sort of standard muscle spasm back pain kind of stuff that half of Americans seem to have, who got opioids in the first week compared to people who didn't, functionally got worse, statistically worse. So it wasn't just that it created dependence or anything else, it was that they actually physically got worse. They were less likely to stay active. They were less likely to go back to work. Those kinds of things. Who is the pusher in all of this? Insurance has helped to drive this too. Because if you're a primary care doctor and you're seeing somebody with insurance X or Y or Z, you'll get paid to see that patient and prescribe a medicine and the medicine will be covered for by the insurance company. But if you prescribe ongoing regular physical therapy visits and a psychologist doing cognitive behavioral therapy, that insurance company either won't cover it or they'll cover five visits, something like that. So that uh, You've, you've tied the hands of the doctors and we're, we're, we're covering the thing that's bad for people and we're not covering the thing that's been shown in research studies, many, to make them better. The makers of our healthcare system seem like they just don't care about wellness. They just care about something they can process on a piece of paper. Uh, I'll answer that one again too. Um, we don't have a healthcare system we have an unorganized healthcare system and why many people have pushed for a single payer. Now, you know, we're not communists, we're not socialists, but what we are is doctors and you won't find many doctors who would say, you know, the way insurance covers things, it creates bad care. The United States uses 90% of all the prescribed opioids in the world 90%. 90%. Westernized European countries did not have this opiate thing. And so this whole thing with prescribed opioids, getting people dependent who then later move on to heroin, has not happened to much of any degree in European countries, in other countries around the world who have healthcare systems that have some direction that, that decides to pay for things that are more healthy and not pay for things that aren't so healthy because there's some sort of central planning of that. In the United States, it's driven by the buck. 60 Minutes, in partnership with the Washington Post, recently did a great piece on the opioid crisis. Pharmaceuticals and distributors spent $102 million lobbying Congress from 2014 to 2016 to make sure the pill mills stayed open. Our question for Dr. Saxon and Reese is, did the partnership between Congress and the pharmaceuticals create the deadly epidemic we now face? Well, I think it's uh, very complicated. And so it's, uh, yes, the, uh, we do have a system where uh, uh, drug companies can make more money by selling more product. And if you have a product that people uh, have a disorder and they absolutely need to have that product, obviously your sales are going to go up. Um, I think, again, we've already mentioned that 
uh, the whole medical community became uh, misguided. Um, and then uh, we had the, um, the, the Great Recession, which caused a lot of people to have dislocated lives and a, and a lot of stress. And I already mentioned that if you've had stress in your life, you're more prone to like the opioids and develop problems. But if you're employed and you have a job and you have a place to live, you have less stress than the person who suddenly loses her or his job and, okay. yeah. Are we just weak? Are we so weak that we, we have to have some kind of of euphoria created by a drug to be able to get through? I don't think so. I think that we're just like human beings everywhere around the world and we happen to have this bad set of circumstances occur in our country. And I think it's important now also to talk about some of the ways that we can uh, deal with the problem and get out of the problem. Yes, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about treatment. So uh, when people develop opioid use disorder, we have found, and this, so this is in contrast to people who just have chronic pain where psychotherapy is very good for them. Mm -hmm. We found that people of opioid use disorder, the uh, withdrawal syndrome that they have when they try and come off opioids is so severe, and the effects that opioids have had over time on their brain and their body have changed their brain and body so much that they absolutely need to be on a medication uh, in order to recover from opioid use disorder. And right now, uh, if you have opioid use disorder in the U.S. and you come into treatment, the chances are three to one that someone's going to tell you what you need is talk therapy and you don't need medication. And we need to turn that around and make sure that everyone with opioid use disorder gets medication as the first line treatment. Now, having talk therapy in addition to that can often be very helpful, but, we, but the, the mainstay of treatment for this disorder is medication. We have three FDA approved medications that all uh, have been tested in the gold standard for determining if a medication works, which is a randomized controlled double blind placebo controlled trial, which sounds like a lot of jargon, but I can explain that quickly. That means that people don't get to choose their treatment, they get randomly assigned to the treatment. And double blind means that neither the researchers nor the patients know whether they're getting the active medication or the placebo. And that way you control for expectancies and getting the effects of the medication. And all of these medications uh, perform better than, th than uh, a sugar pill, essentially. And so the three medications that we have are methadone, buprenorphine, which Dr. Reese already mentioned, and then naltrexone. And each of those have somewhat different mechanisms of action. Uh, so that gives us a pretty good coverage of potential options. Are they addictive as well? The term addictive is a little bit of a loaded term. Yes. And so um, the, so there are um, two physiologic criteria that go into determining a use disorder, which is uh, tolerance and withdrawal. So two of these medications, methadone and buprenorphine, do cause tolerance, meaning that you're going to require to have the opioid and, they, and people do get withdrawal if they come off of them. But they're in many ways uh, very different in their mechanisms of action than some of the opioids that people misuse or that people develop a use disorder on. And then the third medication, naltrexone, is an opioid antagonist. Uh, so it goes to the opioid receptor and blocks it so that if people tried to use opioids, the, the opioids can't get through the receptor and have any effect. So if someone is concerned about taking a medication that they would have uh, tolerance and withdrawal, with, with they could use the naltrexone. But they, the syndrome of addiction goes way beyond physiologic tolerance um, or withdrawal. It's a whole range of be maladaptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And we find when, in most cases, when people get on these medications, even if they uh, have physiologic effects that are like other opioids, the rest of their lives stabilize. So they can go back to work. They uh, can, their, their relationships become solid again. They uh, don't have cravings to go out and use these other drugs. They um, aren't out driving their car while they're intoxicated, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So e every other component of what we consider a use disorder can get better even while they're on these medications. Basically with heavy use over time of street opioids or heroin or pills, what happens to this subset of people who are genetically set up for this or otherwise fall victim to, to developing an opiate use disorder is their opiate system becomes damaged. 
and it becomes damaged in such a way that we don't know actually how to normalize it. It becomes damaged just like people can be born without diabetes and somewhere along their lives in their teens or 20s they develop diabetes and their sugar processing system becomes damaged. They then need insulin or other medications to stabilize that sugar management system in order to lead a more normal life. And no matter how you talk to them, that's not gonna change. So you need a medication to form the base of treatment. Then behavioral things on top of that can cause better function and, and more recovery. But without that medication to stabilize the system, they're gonna be in trouble. The same is true with opiate people. People that have developed opiate use disorders have destabilized their opiate system, it becomes dysregulated, and again, it's steering the ship, not the person. So all the medications that we give stabilize, I call them opiate system stabilizers, because without a stabilizer, you can talk to your green in the face, and that person is off needing to get their drug. So it's an important thing for people to realize because again and again, and Andy and I've run into this so many times, we see people who've tried abstinence treatment and talk therapy and gone off to Sunrise Hills Treatment Center or whatever uh, and, and relapsed again and again, often dangerously. Remember about 20% of people who relapse after abstinence-oriented treatment or after jail or after being in the hospital or whatever, when they relapse, they relapse seriously, either nearly dead or dead or in the ER or in the ICU with uh, brain and lung damage for maybe the rest of their life. So recognizing that people need an opiate stabilizing medicine as a basis of treatment is the most important thing for people looking at this show to remember. Dr. Saxon, Dr. Reese, thank you very thank much you. for being with us.